Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm Gus Stocker. On this episode, I talk with Vincent Boulani. Vincent is a senior researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and there he spent several years researching the combination of artificial intelligence and nuclear weapons systems. In this podcast, we talk about his findings, we talk about the key lessons that we should take for how to do this safely, and we talk about several specific policy measures that might reduce nuclear risk. Here is Vincent Boulani. Vincent, welcome to the podcast. Hello, and thanks for having me again. Fantastic. You have a system for categorizing the risks posed by artificial intelligence and nuclear weapons. And this system consists of concentric circles. Maybe you could explain how you categorize these risks. Thanks. Um, so yes, yeah, so, uh, as part of our work, we, we, we thought that it would be kind of helpful to, add, to kind of distinguish the risk based on the, like, what is the source and nature of the, the kind of the core problem. And we found that there's the kind of different layers. And as you said, like, so we have these different concentric cycle and let's say like the, the base one, like the, the broadest one uh, is the fact that we are talking about um, a technology that has inherent technical, technical, technical limitations. So it's like the, the, the problems are related to how AI actually works or doesn't work. And these are the, like the fundamental problems. So they include the things related to uh, when you have machine learning systems, that is the so-called black box problem. There are issues related to the opacity of, of uh, algorithm, um, which might in turn lead to kind of problem of predictability of behavior when we are talking about, for instance, kind of um, onboarded system like autonomous uh, robots and so on. What is the, the black box problem, for example? What do you mean by opacity of the machine learning systems? I'll try to kind of give a, a, a non-expert answer, given I'm not an actual kind of AI technician um, or researcher. But the, AI, the, the basic problem is that when for certain type of, of, um, of machine learning methods, uh, including methods like, like deep learning, the process is such that you train the system to do something and you know what data, the input of the system, you know the output, but you don't necessarily know what's happening in between. So... The system learns to do something to recognize, I don't know, a cat based on a, a millions of pictures of cats that you provide to the system, label pictures. And the system learns to kind of identify elements on the picture that will, you know, to recognize a cat. But you don't necessarily know exactly how the system is making this different connection and making this statistical relationship between different data points. So you know that the system may be recognizing cat at 99% accuracy but you don't necessarily know what are the criteria used. So it can problem to can lead to problem of um, predictability and reliability because um, if you are using, we are replacing a cat by a tank. And if you train the system by recognizing tanks by using a lot of pictures of tanks, you know, uh, a, a classic example that people gave is that there's the risk for instance that the system recognize tanks by just identifying elements related to the green color or green background like a lot of pictures that you have might be like oh these are tanks in the forest so if there's a, a tree then it means that probability that it's a trunk is high and so and the fact that we don't necessarily we don't have really good methods to understand how the system learned can be a problem in the context of military use of ai so i, I know that there's a lot of research ongoing to try to kind of solve that issue which create kind of you know safety problems and security problems and so on but that's one of the you know, one of the technical challenges as to recent advances of, of AI in, in, I mean, when we talk basically about machine learning. So that's the biggest concentric circle containing the inherent problems with artificial intelligence and machine learning systems. Within that circle, you then have the combination of military applications with AI. Yeah, so, so basically all the problems I just mentioned do not disappear, but then, then it's important to kind of move into things that are related to kind of the impact that AI have on the military sphere. So basically how AI is kind of like impacting notably um, the way we develop um, military system, uh, but also how it's affecting military practice and especially military decision making. And so in the previous podcast, we mentioned a few, some of the problems. So the fact that 
then AI is a kind of intangible technology it makes in the military domain that's potentially problematic because it makes it harder for for one country to identify the capabilities of the other country. In turn, also during the conflict, if you know it, if you are the one deploying a system that might, you might have problem with the problem uh, with this thing called signaling. So signaling your intentions and capability can also be harder, or it's more easily that the other side might misunderstand your intentions or your actual capabilities and react in a disproportionate way. So this kind of like this kind of strategic kind of calculus make arm it harder, but to some extent. Uh, and another um, issue is the fact that as AI is enabling more automation of military decision making and some type of processes, there is the fact that it potentially increases the speed of warfare that allows people, I mean, states to kind of fight at machine speed. But then it kind of has an impact on military decision making, where the decision making time is reduced. Potentially, like there's a erosion of human judgment or like of human control over some critical decisions. And that can lead to kind of different type of like security, like strategic problems, but also things related to more the realms of ethics and whether like it undermines people's ability to kind of comply with the law and so on. How does this problem play out? Is it the case that the speed of military action is increased if you have two militaries both using AI technology to fight each other? Or is the pace or the speed of warfare also increased if you have one military using more conventional method methods and one military using AI to in the in a military context. So of the two cases that you mentioned, obviously the first one is the is the more extreme one where this is kind of the a race to the bottom in the sense of where if both states have the impression that speed is the kind of the critical element for having a, a strategic advantage or competitive advantage over your enemy, then you have that that dynamic where the, the both sides are incentivized to maybe automate more um, and that speed up the kind of like to speed up the decision making time to have to pre- to gain precious seconds or minutes over over the enemy and that's where potentially that can lead to to in some cases to problem if uh, because it makes maybe the interaction between human machines more more sensitive uh, it, it might increase the risk of accident in advanced escalation based on like you know um, frame of like judgment in time critical situation and so on. Yeah. What about this problem of AI technology um, being kind of stolen by uh, non-state actors? So what I'm what I'm thinking about here is maybe terrorists could get access access to drones that are that contain highly capable AI technology. So, uh, thanks. So that's definitely um, uh, another set of risks that you may put into this second layer of the kind of AI plus military risk. Uh, and one is, I mean, it's not a new problem. The, the fact that some technologies are being diverted and misused by malicious actors like terrorist groups or rogue states, it's, it's not new. I mean, we have seen the case already with with drones and you don't even need to kind of put AI in them, like just remotely controlled drones where... I think the challenge in the case of AI and robotics in general is that we are talking about weapon like technology that are highly dual use in nature, um, where the the need what what is needed to kind of weaponize the technology might not be so technologically technologically complicated or difficult, um, and the fact that a lot of like commercial technologies are actually pretty good, and it doesn't it wouldn't require much from a from an actor, especially an actor that does not care so much about safety and performance, to kind of just take a commercial technology, weaponize it in ways that would be, you know, potentially disruptive. So, and we have seen cases in the past where hobbies drones, like recreational drones, that the ones that you can buy uh, on Amazon, uh, have been uh, used in a conflict in Ukraine, have been used in Syria to uh, basically as, as flying kind of uh, ID, so in provides an explosive device, um, where basically they take, they take the drone and mount uh, a grenade on it and just, just fly it to a destination to kind of bomb a military base or whatever. Um, so we have seen that in the past. So there's, there is that it can also be the case with some other type of AI technologies that these commercial technologies can be misused is, is a real problem. Um, and in a way, it's already, it's already, the genie is somehow already out of the bottle. 
Um, and is that because these AI technologies are open source? They're available uh, on the internet to be incorporated in various applications or in what sense is the genie already out of the bottle? I mean, it's partly this one that that one dimension is the fact that a lot of the baseline kind of technology that you need, like you said, a lot of algorithms are open source or easily accessible on the internet. A lot of databases are open source or like easy to access where you can train your system to recognize things and objects and so on. So that's one dimension of the problem. Um, the openness of the AI. Um, and the, another problem is the fact that the, the knowledge to develop AI system is fairly widely distributed. So if you compare to nuclear technology, nuclear power technology, like the, it's, there's not as many kind of um, like people that have the know-how to kind of turn civilian nuclear uh, technology into like, and make a nuclear bomb out of it. So it, it demands a very kind of like niche skill set and also like financial resources and so on. But this demand in terms of like skills and financial resources are much lower when you talk about the ISO. And when I said that the genie is out of the bottle is that we have seen already cases where some civilian developments have been weaponized in ways that are disruptive. So I'm thinking, for example, of the case of um, deepfakes, so the, the misuse of uh, generative ad address neural networks, or um, a kind of AI development that allow AI to kind of create new content, like uh, new, uh, you know, like develop, develop new photos or art pictures based on existing photos and pictures. Uh, that can be, that has already been used for uh, disinformation purposes. Um, for instance, so it's kind of a very concrete case of the fact that some civilian technologies, people that developed that had no intentions to kind of do harm, but some other people might find ways to kind of misuse that. So then the question is, how do you mitigate potentially that risk in an effective way? We have the biggest concentric circle, which is just the problems inherent with AI. Within that circle, we have the problems that arise when we combine AI with military applications. And within that circle, we then have the combination of AI and nuclear systems. So, the, so nuclear systems, the problems with uh, combining AI with nuclear systems, this problem, it, it contains everything uh, from the from the broader circles. So uh, to solve the, the problem of combining AI with nuclear, we have to solve all of the problems we just talked through, in addition to some problems that, that we can discuss now, which is which problems are speci arise specifically when we try to combine AI with nuclear technology. Thanks. So basically, the, these are the kind of like the nuclear weapon specific problem. And in a way, they are not new. Uh, this problem exists before with other technologies as well. Uh, AI is just reinforcing them potentially, also changing their nature. Uh, but basically, these relate to the fact that AI, the progress of AI might have an impact on states, uh, see their ability to retaliate um, against a nuclear first strike. And so basically, you know, how confident they are in their deterrent architecture, deterrence architecture. Um, and basically, the impact would be threefold. So A, uh, we could see a dynamic where there's a kind of instability created by the fact that they engage in some form of a harm's race behavior where they try to kind of match each other's capability in the field of AI or respond to, okay, let's one state is, is advancing on, uh, on AI, the others feel like it, feel it not able to compete. So it's maybe balancing that, offsetting that with other, um, you know, weaponry development. So like in terms of like maybe adopting uh, more nuclear weapons or modernizing the the nuclear arsenal. That's one option. The other option is that also, like, it would, um, and critical option, it could increase nuclear risk in two ways. A, um, the development of deployment of AI in some nuclear um, related systems like command and control and early warning and so on could potentially increase the risk of accident, uh, accidental escalation, um, or inadvertent escalation. Uh, and we talked about that in a previous podcast where. Either the system is failing and, and you know leading people to take the wrong decision and launch a strike, or that it could like people might misunderstand or misinterpret the situation and also take the wrong decision. And um, and the final option is that it could also like increase what we call like the first strike instability, where if states are 
less confident in their ability to retaliate, they might be incentivized to act quickly and launch a first strike to prevent. Um, and that would basically, like, you know, basically a threshold to go to the nuclear level could be reduced. All right. So you've been researching the problem of combining nuclear weapons with artificial intelligence for a number of years, and you've come up with uh, some lessons that uh, that the world should incorporate to make our, to make ourselves uh, more safe, basically. The first of these lessons is that a human should remain in the loop. What does, what does this mean? And how do you, how do you make sure a human remains in the loop? Yeah. So maybe just to kind of say a couple of words of intro. So one of them, um, we, we find lessons from the past, mainly because like automation, which is one of the key features of, of AI is, is not fundamentally new in the context of, of uh, the nuclear deterrence architecture. A lot of things have been automated. Uh, states have been, uh, nuclear have been relying on computer and algorithm for, for a long time. And one of the lessons from the past is that it's good to you to keep human in the loop um, because systems might not be 100% reliable. And there might be cases where humans' ability to have to use some kind of common, common sense will be you know critical um, and to keep human as a kind of fail safe mechanism is is essential um we have seen cases in the past like the famous one uh, is the 1983 uh, petrov incident um where basically this this uh, the commander petrov who was in charge of supervising the early warning and system of the, the soviet union was able to kind of understand that when the system detected that the us was uh launching a strike against Soviet Union, he understood that something, because he knew the system was not highly reliable, and he kind of understood, that, okay, there must be a technical glitch, something is, this doesn't make sense. And he decided not to report up the, the incident, and that basically prevented a third, you know, nuclear, um, yeah, third world war and nuclear use and nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons. So that the key lesson from there is that it's good to kind of keep a human in the loop, to keep also the early warning system separate from the new command control, and that humans are like kind of it's air gapped and the human is in in the middle. Mainly to do one thing: to interpret the information and try to kind of um, and then actually con- like engage in the decision of authorizing the nuclear weapon launch, so that it's so it's not you don't automate that process fully, so the system detects something and then. Um, does that make sense? Makes perfect sense, Jack. Could we imagine a situation in which artificial intelligence gets so advanced that keeping a human in the loop would actually make, make the system less safe? So if we take the example of autonomous cars, for example, I assume that at some point, autonomous cars will get so good that keeping a human driver in the driving seat will, will make the car less safe. It, does a similar point hold for, for nuclear launch systems? Or are we just so far away from that point that it doesn't really make sense to talk this way? I mean, it's it's a difficult question. I would I would argue that it's there's a the technical argument of like you know weapons. I mean, systems technologies are become more reliable than humans. That could be that's a point that could be made. That but it doesn't mean that you you need to remove humans from the decision making loop and. You can have both. You can have a system that is really that is really good at detecting things and providing information, but but given that we are actually talking about you know the use of nuclear weapon systems, just like you could also make just the ethical argument that it's it should humans should be the ones like making the final call. Like even if the systems are really good at making assessment and detecting things. In most cases, also because you have you will you, you will have the time to make some decision. It's not like it's you need to make a split second decision, and therefore you need to automate fully. Like it it makes sense to kind of keep humans as the kind of the ultimate kind of um, decision maker. So it's not just a technical point. There's also an ethical point in keeping humans in the loop. Yeah, I mean, I think it, and it's it's something that came out clearly from the research that we did, and when we engage with different experts, that in general, like it's if there's one decision that is high, the, you know, like extremely political, is the the decision to kind of use nuclear weapons. There's clear, clear processes that have been established by 
by states and generally they all involve like you know the decisions has to be made by the highest level of command usually like the head of state uh involving other people that also can can balance that decision so you don't have um, just one person making deciding everything like someone else also has to win so yeah it it's it it's the highly and highly political process and it wouldn't it seems like most states would agree that it wouldn't make sense to automate that. Yeah, so the first lesson is that we should keep humans in the loop. And the other side of that coin is then that keeping humans in the loop won't solve all our problems. Uh, human supervision is not a panacea, as you write. Um, why is this the case? So I think the, the argument is, is to say that it's also just mindful to kind of so looking back at the past, like a lot of incidents happen from the interaction between the human and the automated system. And so having a human supervising the system might not just might not be enough in itself. I mean it's important to kind of bear in mind that a lot of problems can happen from the you know the interaction and it as systems become more complex, it can be challenging for humans to kind of maintain meaningful human control or supervision over the system to be actual be able to understand uh, what the system is doing um, and it's a problem that is well known from the um, you know aerospace uh, industry when commercial air flights like when they have been incident with commercial aircraft it's because like something like the system the automatic system kind of reported a problem and the human was not able to kind of meaningfully understand what the problem was and interact in a in a, in a in a way that would prevent prevent an accident, um, and we have seen also that case in the military context, where there have been some systems in uh, missile defense or like air defense systems that that are, where there was some incident because like the humans either kind of over trusted or under trusted the system, and that led to different type of um, harmful incident. Like a famous example is the the factory site during the Second World, uh, Gulf War in two thousand three, where the um, the U.S. patrol system was involved in two uh, fratricide incidents, um, and part of these incidents were caused by by the interaction between the the operator and the system. And basically, the bottom line from that is that uh, to avoid that problem, uh, it's important to kind of at the technical level to kind of really invest in ensuring the reliability of the system and testing them. So having proper kind of testing and evaluation processes that would also give a, a a good picture of like how reliable the system can be and what are the limitations. It's also important to test like the human machine interaction in a sense, so ensure that A, the design allow the user to kind of w understand the system well. And but also yeah, you test that interaction so you can have a feedback loop where you work out, okay, these are the problems that could emerge in a crisis situation and we'll try to kind of adapt that either at the design stage or through training. And that's the final kind of recommendation it's very critical to kind of ensure that the people that are supposed to supervise this kind of high stake systems are properly trained that they understand the system how basically it works what the problem can be and so that they when the time comes and it's a time critical situation they would be better equipped to to use it properly and that would reduce the, the risk of incident and accident and so on how do we train people to use these systems and what is it that we're trying to avoid which biases uh, in the interaction between the systems and the human uh, are we trying to avoid here? Um, so I guess the general idea is that it's not to kind of train people in like becoming engineers and understand all the aspect of how the system works, but the system should have sufficient understanding of what is the, the baseline of like how the, what the system is recognizing, not recognizing, what are the limitations in terms of like standard of accuracy, precisions, and so on. Um, so having some basic understanding of, of the systems being provided with that required also providing some information about how the system works to the people that will use them. And and they can be trained in actual, like in sim computer simulation, operational training, like um, where they, they will get, you know, some practice. Um, and the, the basic problems that, these training are meant to solve like there are three a um the kind of these are classic problem of human machine interaction the first one is uh automation bias where basically system people might over trust the system and might take the information 
from the system, like in a uncritically, let's say, I'll just say, okay, no, the system is usually good, so it should be right, and I'm not, I'm not gonna reevaluate or like try to question that that input. Do we know why? Do we know why humans uh, fall victim to automation bias? Why is it that we overtrust uh, these systems that we're interacting with? It's, I guess, it's a natural process. I think we will do that when we assume that system is working well. Um, you know, it, we just create that confidence that you know should be fine. Usually, it's fine. Um, so, but in some cases, like you know, when the stakes are high, like it's important to kind of try to keep a critical eye and and try to kind of see whether there's maybe other information that can be compared with so that to to make sure that the information progress is actually correct. Um, the second problem that we identify is is, um, is on the trust. So when it's the opposite, when actually people don't trust the system enough, uh, and that might also trigger another type of, of uh, concern where people might take different decisions than the ones suggested by the system, and this decision might also be, might be hidden fault. So it's about, yeah, that the training is useful in terms of like finding a balance between these kind of two, two ends of the spectrum, right? Either over-trusting or not trusting enough. Um, and the final issue is, is, uh, is the, what we call the out-of-the-loop problem. So how to ensure that when people are not actively supervising a system and suddenly need to supervise it and in a time-critical situation that they are able to kind of regain sufficient situation awareness. Uh, you used the car example before, so it's basically like if you have a self-driving car, car is driving, everything is fine. You're not, you don't, you're not looking at the road, and suddenly the system tells you, okay, now you have to take back control, and you have like, you know, thirty seconds because otherwise it's gonna, we're gonna crash. So that that's that's a very difficult situation where suddenly like someone who's like totally out there, I don't know, watching a movie like Harry Potter, suddenly needs to kind of like take back the wheel can be critical, it can be very difficult. So how do you avoid that? or mitigate that problem in the context of weapon systems. So to ensure that when people need to take back control, they will actually be able to effectively take back control. Or, and if they cannot, what other type of fail-safe mechanism do you need to put in place to prevent that type of, uh, to prevent accident, basically. And we can, we can see how this would be very difficult and increasingly difficult also. As systems become more and more capable, the times in which you need to intervene in the systems, that they... So longer and longer time passes between uh, when you need to intervene in the system. And so maybe you get complacent about intervening. And you can imagine that if you've been sitting and supervising a system for a month, for example, where everything has been working smoothly, and then suddenly you need to intervene, you're not uh, in the right gear to do so. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just uh, trying to put myself in the place of an operator of such a system and thinking how hard it would be to to quickly react to the system failing where, where the system has been working perfectly for a long time. Mm. No, it's, it's an actual operational problem. I think the military in general know that problem pretty well and have been trying to kind of, they have done a lot of research on it and trying to kind of find actual practical ways to kind of min- mitigate it, but it's not, it's not an easy problem. Like, yeah, which, uh, which ways could we mitigate that problem? That would circle back to, um, a, the, there's the training aspect, so ensuring that people are, are trained to kind of to be able to have to respond in that type of situation. There, there are clear protocols to follow, and that these kind of like basic way that they are properly internalized and so on. There's also a lot of research that has been done in terms of kind of like improving uh, human machine interfaces, so that also like the way the, the system is going to communicate information to the user is will also be critical. Um, so basically, like if you have a lot of things like blinking and and red light and sound, like you know that might be overwhelming for the for the people that needs to make the decision. So, um, so yeah, so this this type of like these actual practical things that can be done on a technical level. And finally, um, yeah, there's also the the fact of programming some type of fail safe mechanism in case uh, um, it might be very difficult for the, for the for the people to kind of regain a situation awareness. And the fact of like, um, such real self can also be that the system does not take um, a critical decision. And, and I mean, now we're talking a bit in the abstract, it very much depends on what would be the actual use case, what actual platform we'll be talking about, because then the stakes will be different.
Um, but these are just general lessons. Okay, so we have the first lesson, which is that people should remain in the loop, humans should remain in the loop. The second lesson, which is that uh, humans need to be trained to interact with, uh, with nuclear system, nuclear weapon systems. And the third lesson is then that um, we should not make nuclear launch decisions based on a single source of information. Maybe we can talk about why it's important to have multiple sources of information here. Yeah, so um, the, the lesson here is that also based on past incidents, like it's some of the incidents that we talked about, like the Petrov incident, where that was, you know, that one single uh, sources that provided the information. Um, and basically the, the lesson from that incident, that it's useful to have different different sources of, uh, of information to be able to kind of cross-check and check that actually the, um, this is reliable information. Um, and um, we're not even talking about AI here. I think it's just like the general practice and it's good to kind of, to cross, to cross the, um, the different intelligent sources to kind of verify the information to, to have certainty. So I think that's, that's general good practice for any type of um, targeting decision. And especially when, when um, we talk about nuclear weapons where the stakes are so high that, you know, it's, it's mission critical that you uh, try to kind of verify uh, the information provided by the early warning system. That might include also trying to verify with some form of verified, like with human intelligence, if time allows, which hopefully in many cases it uh, it should provide. Um, um, you should have time for having people to kind of look into things. Yeah. So, so which which um, different information sources can you use here? I'm imagining that say you're looking at an at a uh, an AI system that's giving uh, information about whether a nuclear launch has happened against the country um, to, against the country that, that you're in. Um, if you then try to cross-check that information with other information, wouldn't the other information sources be far too slow to be able to create this scenario in which you have multiple sources of information? Uh, which, which sources, what would be the sources of information in this scenario? So thanks. I think it, thanks for the question because I think it's good to unpack it. Um, so I guess when we say about the AI system detecting things, most likely, like I mean, it's we will talk basically about early warning system or uh, basically a detection system, and the key element of that is you need sensors. So you need that would collect information, and then the AI might help in the detection part, trying to kind of better kind of detect things and recognize objects or like. And that for that you need one way to, to diversify is to have different type of sensors. So you can have use satellite imageries, other type of like um, ground radar, and 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 then you cross these different type of like data sources. And AI is maybe helping this um, different kind of like sensors with with kind of more kind of perceptual intelligence, where you might expect AI will allow the systems to be more ac- accurate in its in its detection capabilities. So that's one way of, of doing it. So you, you diversify the sources and try to kind of cross check whether they all indicate the same type of information. Another way, something that came up in the expert discussion that we had with uh, was that if states are to rely on machine learning system, like I, I, I discussed before the, the reliability problem, the fact that you might not necessarily kind of understand how the system is, is actually working and that might create kind of you know, uncertainty as to whether the system is actually like so accurate. Uh, one argument that has been mentioned is that it could be um, useful to also rely on systems that are trained on different data sets. Um, so you have like, di- you have diversity and some form of redundancy in the kind of like algorithmic kind of like base in a sense where that would, that could give some, some, confirmation that the system is, is providing reliable information. If you know that the systems are working a bit differently, they have been trained on different assets, but they all show the same result, then that if, uh, should give some confidence that information is to be trusted. Trusted. It's a form of redundancy or a form of sanity check where say you have four different machine learning systems trained on different data sets, uh, using different information sources, and then maybe you also have corroborating evidence from from a human investigation. Well, then you can be uh, much more confident that uh, you have the the right actionable information 
um, in, in, in such a scenario. All right. Um, so I'm guessing what the conclusion is here, you also have what you call a precaution for the future, which is that we should think about the pros and how, in which situations we should think about in which situations machine learning systems work well and in which situations they they do not work well um what's the general takeaway here i guess the general takeaway is that we know that machine learning is is enabling the development of more potentially more powerful AI systems that are better at recognizing things, at, at processing different type of information and so on. So there will be an there is a technical incentive to to adopt the advances of machine learning, also in the context of nuclear the nuclear weapon uh, architecture. Even if generally speaking, states are very conservative with the adoption of new technologies when it comes to kind of the the, the nuclear deterrence architecture um, for reasons that are related to kind of safety and security and the fact that it's we are talking about nuclear weapons. So they want to make sure that the technology they're going to deploy can be trusted. So I guess the 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 challenge here like the is that on that the lessons for the future is that if states are to kind of like to adopt machine learning algorithm in, in this context that they should act very carefully because problems would likely come from an immature adoption of the technology where if they are to adopt technology that is not properly tested uh, or that people that are to use this technology have not been properly trained to what, um, you know, how the systems work or how much they might fail and so on, that these could lead to kind of the kind of the risk that we talked about before. Um, so it means that if, if like practical things that would be needed would be that they invest in significantly in, in testing and evaluation that they'll try to kind of notably to kind of develop more kind of explainable AI, uh, but also like they also take into consideration kind of cybersecurity risk associated with uh, AI systems, um, also issues related to data poisoning and so on. So there are a number of like actual things that they will need to kind of invest to ensure that if they are to adopt these technologies, this, this is done in a responsible way. Let's talk about some specific policy measures that we could implement to lower the risks from combining AI with nuclear weapons. First one is, is this uh, issue of a no first use policy? Um, this has been implemented by some countries. And what is it? Why is it that such a policy would make us more safe? Yeah. So perhaps just as a, to, to take a step back, um, in terms of like concrete measures, like one, there's already like existing ways to address the nuclear risk. And there's a, what you may say, like in the arms control toolbox um, that has been developed during the Cold War. People often think of treaties and things like that, or but there are other things that can be done at a unilateral level, also bilateral and multilateral level. And one of them is to kind of engage in, in confidence building kind of measures or things that will give some stability in effect because by and, and 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 these measures or this type of measures have existing for a long time and some of them are highly relevant in the context of of uh, of ai nuclear risk um you just mentioned like the first one is to kind of adopt a no first use policy um two states already have one uh, that adopted that policy unitarily like china and india I will spare you the details, but it's largely connected to kind of like their the geostrategic context in which they are in. Um, but it has argued it has a stabilizing effect because if um, if states have, have said that they will not, they will not use um, they will not conduct a preemptive strike that that should give the confidence to the others that that they should not be too worried. Um, but then there's the question of whether that whether it's politically conceivable or feasible for other states to also adopt a similar policy. When we talked to experts, they were, they were pretty pessimistic about the possibility that um, the US or uh, Russia would also adopt an offer to use. Why? I would argue most likely because of the fact that they believe that their nuclear doctrine, as we say, um, has been an effective deterrent, basically. Um, and they would... They don't think that that would, I mean, they could even argue that that would actually undermine stability. 
What about lowering the alert status of nuclear systems? Is, is that a live option or is that also politically infeasible? So that's, that's also a measure that's connected to the first one, which is basically another way to kind of reduce the risk of nuclear Weapon news is that states have a lower their alert status. So what, what do we mean by uh, alert status? It's like basically how ready you are to launch a nuclear weapon. And the lowest level possible is basically where, you know, the, the nuclear weapons, um, actual nuclear heads and the delivery vehicles are kept separately. And some states do that, um, like India, Pakistan, and China. So like you would, in order to have a launch first, you need to kind of put together uh, the nuclear heads and the delivery, like, and it takes it takes time. So that, that's that's one way of of providing, yeah, very critical time to kind of mitigate the risk of a nuclear nuclear war in a, in a crisis or in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a conflict. Um, states, the United States and Russia are have are, are two that have systems of high alert, means that they can basically launch an a nuclear attack very very quickly uh but here again i think the 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 possibility right now that that state would would um uh, decide to kind of lower the alert status um it's pretty i mean it would certainly be helpful for new reducing nuclear risk um but it's it's unfortunately unlikely in the current political context yeah, so one thing that might be more politically feasible is the option of uh, sharing information between experts and being transparent about how uh, how you're incorporating AI in your nuclear weapon systems. Um, how optimistic are you that this would make a real difference? Yeah, so just to perhaps just explain why it's helpful, I think as as we discussed before, one of um one of the challenge when we talk about AI is the idea that it's an it's an in- intangible technology and it may be hard for both sides to kind of understand each other's capabilities in that area. It's not like with tanks where you can count, you know, the number of tanks that they have or the number of like missiles or silo, like you know, missile silos and everything. Uh, or you know that okay, they have five submarines and we have you know we have two. Um, in the AI context, it's much much harder to kind of determine capabilities. So in that context, the lack of knowledge can be a source of insecurity uh, where states might take decisions based on just guesses or like ill-advised information. So greater transparency on what the systems are doing in the AI space could arguably have a stabilizing effect. Um, and so that could be one one risk reduction measures where uh, states would voluntarily share some information with one another about what they do in the AI space. Obviously, you know, that would be very high level and generic, but that should be enough to kind of at least engage a conversation um, so that they have yeah, some general sense of what the others are doing or not. And it can also provide an avenue for them also discussing more um, uh, political elements like uh, norms around responsible behavior in terms of responsible use of some some uh, some of these technologies, how they would solve some very practical problem like okay, how do we manage escalation in a context where people deploy autonomous unmanned systems in a, uh, how do we ensure that it doesn't lead to escalation uh, and so on. So they, that could be the basis then for more kind of like collaborative risk reduction measures in a sense. But the first step would be to kind of share information. And again, that could also be a useful method for increasing common understanding, creating a common vocabulary, a common understanding of some of the technical challenges or risk and so on. Yeah, so maybe this information sharing could start with academics and experts. And from there, maybe con- various countries would be able to build trust and then move on to inform- information sharing between militaries. Is that uh, possible, you think? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like, if we talk about, you know, f- ways to support dialogue between nuclear armed states, obviously, like, the most feasible is to start at a more 
you know, expert level, uh, so where technical level, um, where you have, you invite either AI expert to talk to with one another around, I don't know, very kind of typical AI problems like uh, explainability of AI or things like that. Um, or you invite scholars in that work with like, strategic studies or international relation or to talk about some, you know, things related to kind of impact on strategic stability, for instance, or nuclear risk or nuclear you know, risk reduction and um, escalation control and so on. So this is an obvious, so like that's most likely like would be the, the most feasible avenue. And then from there, it can generate input that then can fit into more kind of official dialogues between states. So you could, you could also have meetings that are a bit of a mix where you have academics and experts and also some governmental officials that also kind of engage in some shape or form. Uh, and then obviously like at the, high, at the more high political level, you can have direct military to military contact. Um, and even also at the more high political level where states would agree on some bilateral kind of risk reduction measures or make some political commitment toward one another around. Um, yeah, so like in form of like exchanging information or having some form of a hotline to discuss some things. And this seems politically realistic to you? I guess the what is in the current political context, I'll be honest, I think what is realistic is is more to kind of uh, this kind of like expert discussion. Um, and I'm saying that mainly because I know that some of these type of discussion exist and they have been going on for a few years now where they are, they are re- we talk really about at the kind of expert level, um, but there have been discussion involving Chinese expert, US expert, Russian experts, European experts uh, in some small workshops or academic conferences. We did some workshops like this ourselves in the context of our project where we invited academics from. Um, we had the series of regional workshops around the globe and we invited people like representatives from all nuclear armed states. Um, so these, these are doable. Uh, then the question is like, to what extent the output from these meetings can actually feed into more kind of political um, substance. It's uh, obviously like the geopolitical context is difficult. But let's hope that that at least generates some useful information that can be picked up at a later stage. Yeah, it definitely seems worth doing. Vincent, uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing this valuable information with us. Thank you, Anna. And just to to conclude, I want just on a, on the line that uh, the work that I've been referring to and that, that provided the basis for for this interview is is, is a collab- collaborative exercise I worked with. I produced a report with a few other colleagues, a true international team, Laura Salman uh, from the US, Su Fei from China, Peter Topishkanov from Russia, and Moab and Carson from, from Sweden. So we, it's a collective exercise. I want to uh, acknowledge also the, the fact that it's it's not just my research. It's we, we did that together. Yeah, noted. Thank you. Thank you so much again for the invitation.